Welcome to How to Find Free and Legal to Use Images and Media Online. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup Global. I've been with the organization for 6 years, 7 years almost, and prior to that spent a decade working at small nonprofits in Washington, D.C. and Oakland, California. I'm happy to be your host today, and you'll also see on the back end joining us is Ali Bezdikian. She'll be chatting with you throughout the webinar. And she is our interactive events and video producer here at TechSoup Global. So she'll be on hand to help you answer questions, flag them for, for our follow-up and Q&A, and to help make sure that you are well served on the back end of the webinar. Now a look at our presenters for today. We are joined by a really expert panel of folks who will talk about uh, various places to find and use legal images and media online. The first is Jane Park who leads Creative Commons Platform Initiative which seeks to create easy, clear, and enjoyable ways for users to contribute to the commons. Previously, Jane launched the School of Open, a global community of volunteers that runs free education programs on the meaning and application of open for creative endeavors, education, and research. As a founding volunteer of P2PU, she has designed and led courses on creative nonfiction writing, creative commons for educators, and designing collaborative workshops. We're glad to have her and her expertise on with us today. We also have Cheyenne Homan who is the Managing Director of the Free Music Archive, which was founded five years ago by WFMU, a non-commercial freeform radio station in Jersey City, New Jersey. The goal of the Free Music Archive is to provide a platform for Creative Commons licensed music to be discovered, downloaded, and shared. The resource is used by thousands of individuals daily, including remix artists, independent filmmakers, radio DJs, podcast personalities, and users who want to find new artists. She's also the host and producer of Radio Free Culture, a weekly podcast that examines the intersection of digital media and the arts. We are also joined by TechSoup's Jim Lynch, who over his long career at TechSoup has been involved in creating all of TechSoup's environmental programs and has written several pieces about different aspects of everything from where to source images and media, to telework, to refurbishing, and how to revolutionize the workplace and nonprofit life with free and reused resources in the world. So we're really happy to have him on. He's been interviewed extensively over the years on computer recycling, telework, and a variety of green topics by the Wall Street Journal, National Public Radio, PC World Magazine, and many others. So he will be on to share some of TechSoup's resources that have been created in addition. A look at where we are. We have TechSoup staff located in our San Francisco headquarters office, and we have uh, as we mentioned, Cheyenne is over in New Jersey. And go ahead and chat in to let us know where you're joining us from today. We love to see folks from all over the world and all over the country participating in our events. Right now we have around 260 people on. We have folks saying they're from Arizona, Oregon, Georgia, Pittsburgh, Illinois, Los Angeles, Virginia, all over the country. Thank you so much everyone for joining us and for chatting in. A look at our agenda for today. We'll do a quick introduction to TechSoup, and then we'll talk about the spectrum of licenses, Creative Commons, Flickr, Wikimedia, and many more places that you can search for images and media that you need to use for your own resources. We'll have an introduction to Free Music Archive, and then we'll talk about additional sites for free and public domain media, and share some photo tips. We will have time for Q&A at the end, but we may sprinkle some questions throughout, so feel free to ask them when the moment moves you. TechSoup Global is a global nonprofit of 63 partners around the world serving 121 countries, and we are doing that in providing resources, support, technology, and knowledge uh, for those social benefit organizations. You can learn more about our work in our 2014 Year in Review. We are working all over the world, so if you see a dot on this map that's near you, check us out at TechSoup.org or TechSoup Global to find a partner or a NetSquared local meetup in your area. We have served 615,000 NGOs to the tune of nearly $5 billion in technology products and grants to this greater good sector. So I'm proud to be a staff person and also proud to have been a recipient of many of those donations at the small nonprofits I worked for prior to joining TechSoup. 
You can learn more about our donation programs at TechSoup.org. And if you are joining us from a public library, you can also learn about our library-specific programming at TechSoupForLibraries.org. So onto the topic at hand, go ahead and click on any one of these. You can select any that apply to you to tell us where you currently source images or media, whether that's uh, music clips or stock video footage. Go ahead and click to let us know where you are finding things currently. And if there are other places, feel free to chat them in the comments. We don't have the ability to have more than 10 options on this list, and we know there are lots of places to source. So let us know where you are finding things. If some folks mentioning in the chat window, Morgue File, Canva, Photo Bucket, Public Library Holdings, All Free, Pixabay, Facebook, Private Photos, so lots of places, Creative Swap. We won't go through every exhaustive place to find images and media online, but we will mention many today. We hope that you'll learn something from what's shared in today's webinar. I'm going to go ahead and Skip to the search results here in just a moment. I want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to respond. We know you can't see one another's chat comments and, and, and notes, but if we see that you are sharing something useful that would be good for the rest of the audience to know, we'll try and share that back out as well. Other folks are mentioning the Library of Congress, freestockphotos.com, lots of different places mentioned. So I'm going to show the results now, and it looks like the great majority are using Google Images, which can be a little tricky. But that's, it's good to know. And a bunch are using paid stock photo sites or Creative Commons and others anywhere on the Internet, public domain. Those are the big, the big ones that are sticking out on this survey so far. So thank you for sharing that. And so with that in mind, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first presenter and have Jane Park from Creative Commons join us on the line to talk to us a little bit about this spectrum of licenses and how to understand it a little bit better so that when you're using images, you know that you're doing it legally and safely so that you don't get yourself or your organization into any trouble, and how you can also then share your own media out in a way that allows other users to use them if you so choose. Thanks so much for joining us today. Welcome to the program, Jane. Hi. Um, so hi everyone. Thanks for joining, um, and thanks for having me. So I'm going to go over sort of the basics of Creative Commons and how it's grounded in copyright law and how the images that you are finding online, um, you can find um, them under Creative Commons licenses to use for free as long as you follow the conditions. So First things first, um, how I like to explain Creative Commons to people in the simplest way possible is that I like to say we make sharing media online easy, legal, and scalable. And by when I say media, I mean anything that you can create and put into a tangible form. So that includes all the images, photos, but also things like video, music, podcasts, books, um, and even scientific research articles. Pretty much anything that you can create and record, that's media that you can share using Creative Commons. But before I dive into explaining what Creative Commons is and how it works, I want to give you some background on copyright law because Creative Commons is built on top of copyright law, um, and because the current copyright landscape doesn't make it um, exactly easy for you to share media online um, or to figure out what you can do with stuff that you do find online. So we've all seen this. Um, there we go. So we've all seen this symbol, the co All Rights Reserved Copyright symbol with that accompanying phrase. Um, and so we're all familiar with the symbol, but not everyone is actually familiar with how copyright law actually works. So for those who don't know, copyright is a set of exclusive rights granted to creators of original works of authorship. And those creators reserve all of these rights. And these rights include the following. So the right to distribute a copy of a work, to perform or display a copy publicly, to adapt a copy in some way, which means to translate, edit, or remix it. Uh, basically, whenever you want to do anything with a copy of a creative work, you are required under copyright law to obtain the explicit permission of the creator or the copyright owner. And copyright, just like Creative Commons, covers all forms of creativity, including literature, music, architecture, and choreography. So basically any creativity that you can set into a tangible form that is covered by copyright law. And here are a few facts that not everyone knows about copyright and how it works in the United States. 
um, and it's also in many other places around the world. Copyright is automatic, which means that in the U.S. it is granted to you at the instant of creation. You don't have to publish it or register it with any governmental office. You automatically are granted copyright um, as soon as you finish writing that blog post or taking that picture. And the rights that you are granted are all rights reserved, which means you reserve all rights to your creative work, and your rights last a very long time. In the U.S. it lasts your entire life plus 70 years after you pass on, and it lasts 120 years for works owned by corporations such as Walt Disney. And so every time copyright um, is about to expire and your work is about to enter the public domain, the length of time keeps getting extended at the government level. Companies like Disney will lobby Congress, and that's how the copyright law um, lasts so long today. So there's this tension that exists um, copyright law keeps getting more restrictive over time, where, whereas technology is making it easier and easier to share over time. So copyright was created before the Internet, and you have these outdated copyright laws governing um, the digital landscape that we have today. So there's this tension that exists between technological change um, and the law. So that's where Creative Commons comes into the picture. Creative Commons is a really simple, standardized, and legally robust way that creators can use to grant copyright permissions to their media and other types of creative content. It really exists between the space of all rights reserved copyright that I just went over and the public domain. So the public domain, for those who aren't as familiar, is full of works created before current copyright law was instated. So works like Grimm's Fairy Tales or the Holy Bible, and any works created by the U.S. federal government. So for example, all the space images that are taken by NASA are in the public domain automatically because they were created by the U.S. government. But before Creative Commons, you only had these two options. You could either give all of your rights away, put them in the public domain, or you could reserve all of your rights um, under all rights reserve copyright. Um, now with Creative Commons, there's a space between where you can keep your copyright while giving permission for certain uses to the public. So that's what, how and why Creative Commons came into being to give creators more options um, and flexibility in how to share their works. And we do that through our copyright licenses, of which there are six copyright licenses, and they are made up of four different elements. Um, and you can mix and match these four elements to result in six licenses. And those four elements are attribution, share alike, non-commercial, and no derivatives. All of our licenses contain the element of attribution, which requires you to give credit to the original creator. And then on top of that, you can choose to add one or more of the other three conditions. So for example, if you want to prohibit commercial uses of your work um, and you want to reserve commercial rights, you would add the non-commercial condition. If you want to require that people who remix or translate your work also share their derivative work the same exact way, you would add the share alike condition. And if you want your work to be redistributed without any significant changes being made, then you would add the no derivatives condition. So those are the four um, basic elements that mix and match to legally produce six possible combinations of Creative Commons licenses. And this is the entire spectrum of CC licenses um, that we offer that you can use for free to attach to your works. You can see at the top, um, underneath the public domain dedication, which, which I will go to go into in a second, um, is our most open license, which is the Creative Commons Attribution License. And that means you can basically do anything you want with my work. You can tweak it, remix it. You can even use it for commercial purposes, but you have to give me credit. And at the bottom is the most uh, restrictive license, which is Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives, which means that you can't sell my work. You can't uh, make derivative works without my permission. Uh, you can only redistribute my work verbatim as long as you give me credit. And then in between, there are more options. And then at the very top is our public domain dedication tool, which is also called CC0. And that is not a license, but it's a legal tool that you can use to waive all of your copyrights in a work if you so choose. So that won't apply to most people. A lot of institutions do use it, however. So this is CC0. This is what the symbol looks like. Um, Basically, you use this tool if you want to waive all of your copyrights, effectively dedicating your work to the public domain. So a very recent use case of this that you may have heard about is SpaceX. 
So SpaceX is a contractor for NASA, but they're not the federal government. So they take a lot of pictures of space for NASA, but because they're not the federal government, not, their images are not automatically considered public domain. But the public um, recently found out about these photos and they thought, well, these photos should also be in the public domain because they're technically contracted by NASA. And so SpaceX agreed and they said that they would put their images into the public domain. But because there isn't a legal way for them to do that, um, except for using our public domain education tool, they decided to use CC0 to waive all their copyrights in those images and dedicate their images to the public domain. So if you go to the SpaceX website or if you go to SpaceX's account on Flickr, um, you can find all those images in the public domain um, that they used um, to put in there using CC0. So that's a really neat use case there. Um, let me just kind of check on time really quickly. How are we doing, Becky, on time? Do I have time to go into these next few slides? Yeah, I think you do. We are right on time. So great. You can keep going. Thank you. Awesome. So the other thing I wanted to mention is that Creative Commons licenses, um, including our public domain dedication tool, are really designed for the Internet age in mind. We were founded in 2001, so even that is a long time when you um, um, consider the digital landscape and how fast it turns over. But we really designed the licenses so that it could be read by not only lawyers and not only humans, but also machines. So you can see this is a three-layer license design that we have. So at the base of our license, it's the core legal tool. And this means that this is what everyone around the world um, who is a lawyer or a court of law would read. Um, so if you wanted to take you know, a Creative Commons license to court um, based on something, this is what they would use. And so it's, it is legally operable internationally in over 75 um, countries, and it's been aligned to international copyright laws. So it's very legally robust. But then on top of that, because most people in the world are not lawyers, we have a human readable summary. We call it the human readable deed, because it's a summary of all of the most important terms and conditions of the legal license. Um, in a language that normal human beings like you and me can understand. And you can see there that uh, it kind of summarizes the attribution license. You are free to share and adapt as long as you give me credit, which is pretty simple to understand even for elementary age kids. And then the last layer, but probably one of the most important layers for the Internet age, is our machine-readable metadata. And this is just a simple snippet of HTML code that summarizes the license and its terms and conditions into um, language that search engines can understand. So this is what Google advanced search would use to find CC licenses, um, find CC license content on the web, and this is what will help you discover CC license content online, which I will also go over in a few slides. The good news is you don't have to come up with this code yourself. We have a tool that spits it out for you. All you have to do is copy and paste it into your web page if you are publishing your work under Creative Commons licenses. And if you're searching for CC license content, then this layer is really invisible to you as long as you use one of our search tools. So as I mentioned previously, our licenses are operable around the world. These are just some of the countries that our licenses have been aligned to their copyright laws. But of course, even if they haven't been aligned to a specific jurisdiction's copyright laws, they've been aligned to international burn convention laws. So um, it's pretty much Creative Commons licenses exist built on top of current copyright law. And then this next slide um, is a slide from a report, State of the Commons report that we issued last year in 2014 where we got data from platforms and search engines and we found that there were at least 882 million Creative Commons license works out there. So videos, images, scientific data, reports, you name it. Um, that's how many works exist out there on the World Wide Web. And they are all kinds of media, as you can see here, um, photos, scientific data, music. Um, and we found that 58% allowed commercial use. The trend is that since 2001, since Creative Commons was founded, more and more people are allowing uh, commercial use of their works. And even more people, 76% are allowing adaptations of their works. Um, so Creative Commons is really facilitating people to collaborate together to remix and build on each other's works. So where can you find all these millions and millions of works? The main search tool that I will point you to is search.creativecommons.org. It is not quite a search engine, but more of a portal to other search engines and um, the platforms that have enabled Creative Commons licensing. So you can see there that you can search by platforms such as Wikimedia Commons, Google Images, Flickr, 
um, SoundCloud, uh, YouTube. Um, we are actually in the middle of improving Creative Commons Search so that you don't have to click on the specific repository. Uh, pretty soon we hope that it will just search the entire web um, of CC license content at once. Um, so just stay tuned for that, but you can still use search.creativecommons.org in the meanwhile. Um, you can go directly to platforms. You don't have to go through a search tool. You can search if you're looking for Flickr images. You can go directly to flickr.com slash creativecommons um, and browse by CC license. You can also go into their advanced search, Flickr as an advanced search, where you can kind of click and search by license as well. Flickr is probably the biggest uh, platform for Creative Commons licenses on the web, and they recently actually implemented the CC0 public domain dedication tool in addition to the public domain mark, so you can now also search for public domain images on Flickr in addition to our six copyright licenses. Another platform, and this is more for video, is Vimeo. Vimeo has high quality Creative Commons license videos. You can browse um, at vimeo.com slash creativecommons for CC license videos, but they also have CC licenses embedded or enabled in their advanced search. So if you, you can go ahead and do that as well at their website. Another rich resource of um, commons images and other kinds of media is Wikimedia Commons. This is the repository that actually fuels all of the media for Wikipedia. So, um, Pretty much anything guaranteed um, is under Creative Commons or in the public domain or under some other open license. If you go to Wikimedia Commons, you can find something that you can reuse. And if you want to publish your own work under Creative Commons or just kind of play around with what license you might choose for your own work in the future, you can go to creativecommons.org slash choose, and that's our chooser tool to help you decide what kind of license you might want to Choose. And this is a tool that would spit out the HTML code. So if you have a blog or a web page and you want to add the CC license to it, you can just copy and paste that into your web page, web page editor and it will show up on your footer automatically with the license icon and link automatically. We are also probably going to be um, revamping this chooser tool as well, just FYI for the future. And if you have any other questions about how Creative Commons got started or you know, our mission or vision, because we have a lot of programs and projects that go on um, in addition to legally developing and updating our licenses, you can check them out at creativecommons.org. Um, we have a lot going on that I cannot possibly get into in this call, but um, I'm happy to answer your questions at any point. Um, so why don't I pause there? I don't know if there are some questions in the chat that I, I can get to now or later. So I'll let Becky. Yes. We have a whole bunch of questions lining up in chat, and we will do our best to get through them during the bigger Q&A, but I'd like to ask a couple before we move on to our next speaker. You know, is there a cutoff date that if something is um, – you know, somebody mentioned having a bunch of old images from the 19, early 1900s, 1903, 1904, and that those images were then used in a publication in 1985 but didn't have mm -hmm. any attribution, would they have to get permission if they are originally past that cutoff date? And, and what is that year, if there is one, uh, when something is automatically moved into the public domain? Yeah, so the year is 1923. Generally speaking, um, most works that are created before 1923 are considered public domain, but there are exceptions. So I don't know about this specific case that has to look at it, um, and I couldn't you know, give you any definitive answer, but generally speaking, before 1923, those images would be in the public domain. Um, there is actually a, cop, a public domain slider tool that I'm going to find right now and paste it into chat where you can use to calculate whether something you find is in the public domain. Um, but yeah, um, so let me go ahead and find that. But Great. it would and depend on the yeah. I, yeah, and I mean in the chat I said, you know, the safest bet is, you know, even if the images maybe don't require attribution because they're public domain, maybe the publisher of the book in 1985 is worth reaching out to to make sure that you've got permission to reprint something that maybe they printed. That <laughs> I think always exactly. when in doubt, you should ask. That's always my safe safe uh you know, cover your butt uh legal opinion here to be a little crude about it, but you know, I think it's really important that Anytime you're not sure, the best method is to ask. Ask the creator, ask the publisher, ask the, the owner of whatever it is. Um, so let's do just two more questions, and then we'll move on to the next speaker. And we'll keep all of those questions in queue for the Q&A. 
We have a bunch of people asking about how do you attribute uh, when you're giving credit for Creative Commons images. And does it have to be on the same page immediately beneath the image, or is it okay to have you know, a page that just has image attributions for your whole site? What's the right way to do that if you have uh, some guidance on that? Yeah, so I just um, put in a link into the chat. So we have some best practices for attribution guidelines at Creative Commons. Um, the simplest way is kind of be reasonable by medium. Um, and the acronym that I like to use with everyone, especially elementary age kids, is TASL, T-A-S-L, which stands for Title, Author, Source, License. So um, kind of just following that guideline. You always want to um, include the author's name. You always want to include a link to the license that you found the work under so that other people who find that image um, can know exactly what they can and can't do with it. Um, but those are those are the best attribution guidelines right there in the chat. Terrific. And then one more before we move on, and we'll try and get to some of the others a little bit later as well. But if um, you're a library or a nonprofit, are you considered a non-commercial endeavor? And are you still if maybe you have workshops or classes that you may charge a fee for? Does that make you commercial? Or are you a non-commercial entity based on your tax status? How does that definition work? So they're not yeah, so the non-commercial condition doesn't hinge on the type of user. You could be an institution, you could be a for-profit company, you could be an individual. Um, it doesn't matter who you are, it matters what your use is. So if your use is commercial, if you are making money off of the work, um, it's, it's, it, it doesn't hinge on whether you're an institution or a for-profit or a non-profit. You can make a non-commercial use even if you're a for-profit. Um, I can't really interpret the non-commercial condition beyond that for you. It, it is defined in the license deed, um, and I will pull it up right now and send you a link to that. Um, basically, it says a commercial use is one primarily intended for commercial advantage or monetary compensation. <laughs> so I know that's a bit vague, but um, there are certain use cases. That I, here you go. So there's a link to one of our uh, license, non-commercial licenses, and there's pop-ups there that explain it a little bit further. Um, and I can see, I can try and see if I can find some additional guidelines around what a non-commercial use is or not on our FAQ, and put those into the chat as well. So it doesn't Great. Have and, you know, we often have folks email us here at TechSoup to say, "Hey, can we reprint this article? We know that it's licensed Creative Commons, but I'm a professor, and I'm putting this into a guide." with a bunch of other articles, and I'm, I'm charging 20 bucks for it. Is it okay for me to use that? And as the license owner, we can say, sure. It doesn't, you know, we can tell them yes. <laughs> so we can always give permission if we want to. So if you're not sure and you want to make sure, reaching out to the author and saying, hey, we're doing this specific thing. Is it okay for us to use that? And many of these sites, the author information is right there or they're linked as a user and you can just message them directly through Flickr or message them directly through whatever the tool is to ask. And so it doesn't have to be as scary to just reach out and ask too. So I'm going to move us forward so we don't get too far off time, but we'll try and get back to more questions. Go ahead and participate in this quick poll for us. Choose your favorite genre from this list. And if it's not on this list, go ahead and chat in your favorite music genre. And then we'll have our next presenter, Cheyenne Homan from Free Music Archive, come in to talk to us a little bit about where to find and source free music to use. And this is particularly useful if you are creating videos or video clips or screencasts or podcasts where you want to have some background music in there, if you have music on a page on your website, anything you might be doing where music would lend some inspiration to your work. She will talk to us a little bit about how to find different types of music. So I'm going to give just a couple more seconds for those who want to click on their screen and participate. We have folks uh, chiming in, R&B, gospel, hymns, contemporary Christian folk, so lots of things that aren't on this list. Like I said, we were limited to 10 options on my list, but I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results. and show that we have a lot of rock fans in the group and quite a few pop and classical fans. I'm with the classicals. That's my favorite. So with that, I'd like to have our next speaker, Cheyenne Homan from the Free Music Archive, join us to talk to us a little bit about the resources available 
through their site. Thanks so much for joining us today. Welcome, Cheyenne. Yeah, thanks, Becky. Um, so uh, if some of you um, in the earlier sort of poll were asked where you got some of your content from, and I think only – we just barely scraped the double digits. I think we were at like 11 or 12 respondents for the Free Music Archive. So I'm happy to be telling a lot of people about this great resource. Um, we've been around for a few years, and I'm going to go over the search page and how to use an artist page um, because I'm really excited to share with you this, this resource that I don't know just how many of you are familiar with. So about us. We're a small nonprofit with a giant music library. Um, it's affiliated with WFMU, which is a non-commercial freeform radio station out of Jersey City, New Jersey. It's where our offices are. We have more than 80,000 songs in our collection. So we have a little something for everyone. Um, and we take a curatorial approach. So we ask artists to apply to be in our collection. It's not just a giant um, sort of repository for everything. Um, there are a lot more resources in other places on the web. Um, we also have art museums and record labels and venues and more that act as curators as well. So they bring in artists that they're familiar with. Um, most of the tracks listed on the Free Music Archive are licensed under a Creative Commons license in some form. And we have new music every day. So back to our genre question, I asked everybody kind of what their favorite genre was. Here's our genre search tool. Um, and so you can filter by this tool um, by choosing the brightly colored box of, of your favorite genre. Um, but we have way, way more than this. This is just sort of the, the most basic or the most broad um, genre selection that we have. So if you want to search by genre, if you're looking for something very general, uh, you're welcome to use this function. You can also search by curator, um, or in some cases by specific use. So I have an arrow here listing the music for video curator. And everything that's in this is sort of a catch-all category for things that are licensed to be used in video clips. So if you want to make a, a short film about a project that your organization is doing, or you want to sort of showcase you know, say some art that was made um, by, you know, in a, an art class that you held or something. You can look in the music for video category and determine from there. You can kind of drill down and see what, what it is that you want. We have a lot of really skilled composers that have contributed to the Free Music Archive, and um, I can, I'm happy to make suggestions if anybody ever wants. Uh. So, um, you can browse by curator. Different curators have different sort of feel for what type of music they have. You can do uh, yourself. Okay, um, this is the search page. If you click on the Go button, um, which is right here, this will take you right to this, this page. Um, everything is listed in order by the date that it was added. So the things that were posted today or yesterday or most recently will be at the top and everything else follows. You can um, filter these and drill down by genre. You can also use a couple of different search functions that I'm about to show. Okay, so you can search by tempo, by beats per minute. So if you want something that's really fast paced, you can uh, search by BPM. This is kind of a fun tool to look through if you want something that's really, really um, fast paced or something that's sort of more moderate or you want something that kind of flows gently, you can look um, by the beats per minute, which is what BPM stands for here. You can also look by license, and we have a nice um, selection of licenses you can search by, including attribution only. You can look for public domain works. You can look for works that allow for commercial use or in a remix or video. Um, so those can be really useful if you are looking for something for a very specific use. Um, and not something that you're looking for in an aesthetic uh, way. So once you pick an artist, you'll see the artist page. Uh, I've picked here um, a wind, uh, wind quintet, and you can see that they have a picture and uh, one album in their discography on the Free Music Archive. So this collection was posted. Um, if you look down on the left side, you can see the curator and some more information about them below their um, artist picture. When you look 
down here you'll see um, if they're active, if they've chosen to give any sort of information to get a hold of them, uh, etc. And then when you click down on the other side, you'll see a little bar that says License and More Information. And this is really important because though it is uh, everything on the Free Music Archive is free for download and stream, um, it's not all licensed for video. It's not all licensed for remix. It's not all licensed for reuse. So um, that's where this comes in. And you click on this button, you'll see um, the little Creative Commons icon will come up uh, that is in line with how this is licensed. And um, it will show you, and we actually have a link too. So this one is uh, listed under an Attribution Share Alike License. And when you click on where it says Attribution Share Alike, you'll be transported to the Creative Commons license page, which gives you a very um, elaborate or simple, depending on your preference, um, page explaining the exact terms of the license if you're unclear. So um, if you want to use a piece beyond the scope of the license that is presented here, you can contact the artist. We recommend that you do a web search if you can't find them right away. Um, anybody who contacts me to get their uh, contact information for an artist will basically, I, I will end up doing a web search for you. Um, if you look for the website uh, affiliated with the artist or you manage to find them in a web search, you can find their contact page typically, or you can sometimes find an email this artist or a contact artist link on our Free Music Archive profile for them. Um, otherwise, um, we do have sometimes trouble tracking down artists if their bands have broken up or the projects are sort of dormant. So uh, it's not a surefire way, but there are so many artists that are active and that are easy to get a hold of that if, if you are willing to be a little flexible, you can definitely find something. Um, and that's all that I've got for now. Um, if anybody has any questions before we move on, um, I'm, I'm right. open to yeah, fielding questions. Thank you so much for that, Cheyenne. And you zipped right through a lot of great stuff. We have um, some folks, one, one participant chatted in that both her and their uh, video producer who's been around for 20 years doing this are huge fans of your work. So we're really glad to hear that. And we did have a couple of questions. One person asked, um, is there children's music in Free Music Archive? Can you search for that some. by category? Yeah. We actually have a curator called um, KazoomZoom, which is specifically for kids. Uh, but I would say that most of the music, especially the instrumental stuff, all the classical things, um, and things in, in a lot of genres are kid-friendly, um, but music directly or specifically intended for children um, is mostly KazoomZoom. And there are a couple of compilations in there and a couple of albums that I think are actually uh, feature children as singers or or as uh, co-creators. So, yeah, that's fun. That's a fun curator page to bounce through. I love the name too, because Zoom Zoom sounds fun. <laughs> sounds like great, uh, happy peppy stuff that you'd find in yeah. there. Terrific. Um, let's see if there are any other questions before we move on uh, that are specific to Free Music Archive. Uh, somebody asked. Uh, mentioned that there's an app. Do you have an app for Free Music Archive that people can search? Or maybe that was in reference to something else that we came up? We do have an app. Um, however, we are in the process of developing a better one. So if you want to use the one that we have now, its, it's functionality is sometimes a little um, – It's so the, the account that you have on the app – the current app isn't connected to your FMA account on the site. So we're trying to – rework it so that you can link your accounts um, and basically have consistent favorites and playlists and posts and things like that. Terrific. Thank you so much for that. So I'm going to go ahead and move us along to Mr. Jim Lynch, our final speaker, and then we'll have time for your questions uh, that have been stacking up on the back end. So we appreciate that. And we'll continue sharing out additional resources while Jim gets started with taking us through the places to find free and legal images that he has collected. So thanks so much for joining us today, Jim. Take us through your collection. All right. Good to be here. <clears throat> I just wanted to um, mention a few things that actually a bunch of people have mentioned on the, uh, on the chat already. Um, so launching right in, Google Advanced Image Search, and you, you could just search on any kind of 
Google or other web browser and uh, find that. It's really easy to find. Um, enormous results go off of that. Um, it lets, as I mentioned in the slide, lets you search by usage rights. So similar to Creative Commons. Um, the one thing I found is that when I click on an image, uh, sometimes I would say about 30% of the time, I can't get any clarity on what the usage rights are for an image that comes up on this. And so when I don't find that, you know, that clarity on the Google Advanced Image Search, then I just basically don't you know, use the image. So <clears throat> that one's a little tricky to use. I'm getting better and better at kind of sussing that out. They don't make it terribly easy, and that's perhaps what Becky was talking about, that it's a little tricky to use this one. But the huge, enormous results when you, when you get that. The, the second one I have listed on my slide is Getty Images. Now that's kind of a fantastic resource. Uh, also a little bit tricky. Um, Getty is really designed, it's a commercial company, it's really designed for you know, graphic designers, big companies, publications. Um, they were fantastically uh, litigious and lawsuit prone <laughs> going after anybody misusing their images by right-clicking and just downloading them and using them. Especially, you know, all kinds of people got sued and got cease and desist letters from them. And fairly recently, uh, about a year ago, they said, okay, we're going to do something different here. Uh, and they mainly opened it up to bloggers and tweeters. And, and the idea was that you could basically use their images for non-commercial purposes uh, at no cost. And the catch is that you have to use them with their embed frame, called an iframe embed thing. Uh, one of the kind of irritating things about that is that, for instance, our site on TechSoup can't accommodate that. So you'd have to check to see if, you, if the website that you're using or the whatever um, you know, online thing that you're using, like your email client or something, can actually you, you know, accommodate the, the iframe embeds. So that's another thing about that. Uh, the non-commercial thing on this one is pretty important because uh, Getty is very vigilant about people misusing. And so the non-commercial thing is, I think the rule of thumb is more or less if you're charging for your products or services, then it's regarded as commercial. But if it's educational or news, then it's probably fine to use them. Uh, one resource that I, I really love that I found out fairly recently is the Digital Public Library of America. That's, an, that's an, a nonprofit that's based in, in uh, Boston, I think. And it's pretty recent. I think they only opened up in 2012. They've got a ton of stuff, and uh, if you and their and their images are really well marked on their license, how they're licensed. They have a ton of public domain licenses of images, and they have other kinds of media other than and then still images, of course. But um, I use them mainly for if I want to use historical images or fine arts images in my pieces. Um, by the way, I use images a lot because I'm one of our bloggers and one of our writers who writes two or three things per week. So I put, I use images all the time. So moving on to the next slide. Um, so in this slide, I basically uh, included a couple of sources that are, list, are lists of free places that I like. Uh, stock photos that don't suck, I really like. There's <laughs> a graphic designer named Dustin Senos, and he has listed 17 sites that he likes. I won't go into all of them, but they're definitely worth checking out. So, and by the way, you should know that uh, we're going to send you these slides, um, and then you'll be able to you know, just have these URLs for your own use. So don't worry about trying to copy these things down as I breeze through here. Verve is another one. Um, there's actually a little bit of overlap between these guys and uh, stock images that don't suck. 
I mean, they have some common ones, but they also have different ones on this one more. Uh, Pick Jumbo, uh, for instance, is a great site for abstract images, as I mentioned. Uh, I love the name of Morgue File. Um, I use them for uh, animal pictures, which is all the rage on the Internet these days. So if you want to caption an image and turn it into an Internet meme, you know, put a clever, clever bunch of words below a picture to make it ironic. <laughs> we love to do that at TechSoup when we can. Uh, that's a good place for that. Um, I think Sarah Dunn actually uh, chatted in a bunch about the Internet Archive. She's one of our attendees today. Um, it's similar to the Digital Public Library of America. Uh, it has an advanced search feature. There's a fantastic amount of stuff <laughs> on there. One thing I love about the Internet Archive is it has uh, something called the Wayback Machine, where you can get uh, web pages for, that go all the way back to the beginning of, um, of the web, the World Wide Web. Uh, you can actually go look at what TechSoup looked like in 1998, if you want to. It looked pretty pokey back then. But anyway, it's a great place. Uh, and it's a little harder to search on there. They're working on their interface like crazy. But the amount of stuff on the Internet Archive is, is just tremendous. And that's at archive.org. Let's see what else we have here. <clears throat> Pixabay is, uh, is one of the kind of huge stock sites. Um, and this image there of this baboon is from there. Uh, they have a nice kind of list of 20 different categories I like. Um, yeah, but I like actually using their search function more on Pixabay. I like that one. Uh, free Images is um, an easy to use site. And it has, uh, it, I don't think it uses Creative Commons. It's got its own image license agreement or open image license agreement. Um, and they have just a huge, huge collection there. And I think the last thing I want to talk about a little bit uh, is the fact that you know, fair use, copyright, U.S. copyright fair use. And that's a thing that we use at TechSoup for, for instance, if we want to put in somebody's logo for writing about a nonprofit organization or even a commercial company, then we can actually just use their logo without asking permission or without any uh, need to you know, put an attribution there. And in addition to that, uh, pictures of products actually are under fair, fair use doctrine. So if a you know, company has put out a new product and we want to write about it and tell everybody about it, we'll, we can actually use the image of that new product, or it can be an old product as well. Uh, I usually go to the source on that. So if it's a Samsung product, I'll go to the Samsung website. I won't use a secondary site like CNET or some other uh, review kind of site to get the image. So I'll go straight to the source. And um, one thing we're really careful to do here at TechSoup is give pretty good attribution where we found things and where you can get them. So uh, reiterating a little on this, that uh, we always put where the where we originally got the where we originally got the image, and we try to put the name of the author if we can, and then we also put in, in our attribution, the kind of license, if that's appropriate. So I think that's it for me. Right? Thank you, Jim. We also had a slide, we had a couple of slides here that just has oh, yeah. some info about how we use images. And Jim mentioned some of this, but we didn't have it on screen for you to see. But these details will be also in the slide deck that you'll get later today. I'm going to move forward just to show um, a list of resources that are on TechSoup that are about images and whether you can use it for a website or a newsletter, sources for free images, graphics and images. I wanted to highlight just a couple um, quickly, and Jim, you can highlight others as well if you'd like. Um, you know, we have some things around recording audio of your own if you're new to that and you're looking to do that, uh, creating your own images. Um, also, uh, you know, these include a lot of the resources we've covered today, finding and using images from the web. Uh, how to choose them, lots of resources there. And then for those of you who serve audiences where you may have minors, children, uh, you know, where your patrons or your constituents may be uh, you know, domestic violence 
or homeless populations or more sensitive populations to having their images used. Uh, any, any population, if you're using your own images, you may want to look at model release forms and look about you know, how you can implement those at your own organization. And so we did a webinar about a year ago, maybe a little more, where we had a couple of model release samples given to us to use, one for a general population, one for minors. And so I wanted to point that out in case any of you need that type of thing, that we have some samples there, and um, a whole bunch of resources around uh, storytelling and digital media. So check out some of those. Jim, did you have any others you wanted to highlight on this list before we get to Q&A? Yeah, I think um, the one thing I use quite a bit is I, I fiddle with images. I resize them. I you know, maybe put captions under them or on them, things like that. So the free graphics software and images is a place where you can find out some tools, really easy to use, free online tools that will allow you to do those kind of manipulations that you want. Lots of times you have to kind of like resize an image or change its, uh, how it appears on your page a little bit. You have to tweak the image some to get it to, to look right. Great, and very true. And kind of with that in mind, we have a lot of questions in the queue and a, a handful of people have asked, so I'll have Jean approach this one. Um, in regards to cropping, modifying, changing size, are those considered derivatives if you crop a, a wide shot into a headshot, for example? Is that, do you need permission to have a deriv does it need to be licensed with derivatives permission for you to do that? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what cropping entails with the licensing? Yeah, so I would interpret cro cropping and slight modifications as not a derivative. Um, derivative means it has to be original enough to merit to be a new creative work. So generally cropping, resizing, things like that, changing formats, changing formats is definitely not a derivative work. So um, you can go ahead and do those things even if it has no derivative condition on it. Um, if you, you know, alter it like Shepard Fairey alters it, then, then yeah, the, the no derivative condition, but condition would kick in. But you know, even beyond the, the Creative Commons license, I think Kevin mentioned if it's a fair use, such as Shepard Ferry was arguing for his um, Photoshop of Obama's picture, then it, it, Creative Commons licenses don't prohibit that. Fair use applies above and beyond Creative Commons licenses. So definitely feel free to rely on fair use um, if it's you know, a parody, um, something like that. Great. And you were chatting out some things, broadcasting to all, specifically around the logo so, and fair use. So I just want to make sure that that's clear for folks so they know when they need to ask permission or how they need to go about that. Um, can you clarify a little bit of that? Oh, for logos, I was just saying things like the Creative Commons logo is not governed by copyright but by something separate called trademark law. So we don't – our Creative Commons logos are not um, free for you to share at will. It's, <laughs> it's actually governed by a trademark policy, which means that you, you know, there are certain policies like you should link back to Creative Commons if you use our logos or link to our licenses when you use our um, license icons. And that makes sense because we don't want our brand diluted um, so that our licenses are recognizable and clear for people um, and it doesn't get confusing. So I can paste in a, a link to what our trademark policies look like as an example of what other companies' policies might look like. Okay, and then our communications, one of our communication staff is on this webinar listening in too and, and mentioned that you know, if there is a branding guide that an organization has or company has online about how to use their logo, you should be following those guidelines. So even if you can use it, you want to make sure that you're not doing things with it that they don't want you to. So it's always a good idea to see if they have media resources like a branding guide or uh, you know, a usage guide, or if they post their logos for you to share an impress kit or something like that that you're following the instructions. Jim, you wanted to add something here? Yeah. Uh, the stuff I've been reading on usage of logos is that I think the main concern is that um, you, you know, all of us should avoid not impersonating a company or an entity acting like we're part of them or that logo belongs to us or is associated with us in any way. And so that's kind of the rule of thumb that I've been coming across in fair use. Great. Yeah, no impersonating. <laughs> Unless maybe you're doing a parody and then maybe you, that would be acceptable. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, let's see. So we have a question from Christopher. So as a media creator, um, 
how do artists survive by permitting organizations to use their work without compensation? And so I guess this would be Jane and Cheyenne, if both of you or either of you want to chime in on this. You know, how do you still make money off of your images if you give it away? Or do most of them give pieces of it away in the hopes of getting a fan following that then they can charge for? What's the strategy there? So I can start and then Cheyenne can jump in. Um, so if your primary um, method of sharing, your primary goal for sharing your work is to make money off of it, then yeah, then you probably don't want to share all of your work under, for free. Um, you want to reserve some rights. So that's the way we have the non-commercial licenses where you can reserve commercial rights. And um, Becky is exactly right. So if you're first starting out and you want to spread the word about your music or your work, um, you would want to release it more, under more liberal reuse terms so that people can feel free to redistribute it and get your name out there. And then you, know, you would want to reserve all rights to other um, assets that you have that you do want to make money off of. Um, so there are all kinds of experimental things you can do. Generally speaking, with the Internet, even if you don't put a CC license on it, if you just put something online, people share it freely anyway. So adding a CC license kind of clarifies for the end user what they can and can't do with it and how you want it to be shared. So I think that's one of the benefits of CC licensing. Great. Anything else you want to chime in with that, uh, Cheyenne? Yeah, I was just going to say that I've spoken to a lot of musicians about this. And um, you know, it, Creative Commons is an opt-in thing to start, and there are conditions that you can place on a work that enable people to access it, but not necessarily use it for commercial purposes. So um, I think that, the, though ironically almost, the people who have been sharing under the more liberal licenses, such as CC BY, have had more commercial success with their work um, being licensed um, for use in commercials or films. So it's, it's kind of Six and one, a half dozen in the other, I think, as far as music goes. But it's definitely important to um, remember that it, this Creative Commons license isn't just CC BY, that there are six different ones to choose from. It's a great reminder. And yeah, it's important as a, if you are a creator of media or if you're taking photos or if your volunteers or patrons or constituents are taking photos and letting you use them, that you know, you're conscientious of how you post the licenses on those. So you're asking them if they're the creator or your staff people as the creator, how do you want this licensed if we're posting it to our Flickr feed or if we're posting it to our Instagram, and that you're aware of that, that spectrum of licensing you can choose from and how that you know, how they prefer to be licensed. So I'm going to go ahead and move us forward since we're at the top of the hour. We did get through a lot of questions, but I would love it if you would chat in to let us know one thing you learned in today's webinar that you'll either take home and do something with or try to implement on your own or for your organization's benefit. And we'd also like to ask you to pledge to share this information with your colleagues and friends to make sure that they know where they can find free images and media online and use it legally. That's what we like to help support. So we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much to Jane, to Cheyenne, and to Jim. And also thank you to Ali on the back end. I'd love to invite you to join us for some of our upcoming webinars and events. You can join us next week for a conversation about launching your 2015 grants plan with GrantStation. So if you're looking to learn more about grant writing, we'll be talking strategy next Thursday at the same time. The following week we'll be talking about copywriting for the web, how to write with today's best practices in mind so that your audience not only hears you but wants to engage in your mission and your work. Then we'll be talking about how to think like a search engine and working on your search engine optimization. And then on May 20th we'll be talking about teens and tech and successful STEM programs in libraries. We have many more coming up beyond that, so watch our calendar and visit our archives for more. You can visit us at TechSoupGlobal.org, TechSoup.org, on our Facebook, and on our Twitter channels. We really appreciate you all joining us today. Thank you so much lastly to our webinar sponsor ReadyTalk who provides the use of this platform for us to present these webinars to you on a weekly basis. When you close out of our event today, please take a moment to complete the post-event survey to let us know how we did and how we can continue to improve our webinar programming. Later today you'll get that email from me that includes this full recording, the slides, and many of the links that we discussed today. So if you missed any part, watch for that, and feel free to share it and pass it along. TechSoup's content is also Creative Commons licensed, so you can take our webinars and share them on your own YouTube channel and on your own site as well giving us attribution. So thank you so much everyone, and have a terrific day. Bye-bye.